Hey everyone, I'm Mitch. I'm one of the pastors here and you're watching episode two of a series of messages we've been calling the kids in our lives. Let's get going. I'm sorry, mom, for all the endless piles of laundry. Arms up. Sorry, dad, for all those sleepless nights. I'm sorry, dad, for always getting into trouble. I'm sorry for not giving you one moment of silence. I'm sorry for everything. Really sorry. I'm sorry for always fighting with my brother. For treating you like an ATM machine. Last week, I started with this question. I'm going to come back to the same question. The question is simply, who are the kids in your life? That's who I want you to have in mind as we're walking through this series together. And if you're raising young kids or teenagers right now, of course, your kids go in that blank. But it's totally possible that, that you don't have kids yet, you're single, you haven't been married yet, you're, you're older and your kids aren't at home, and, and you should put someone else's name in that blank, someone from the next generation to make sure that you know God has placed kids in your life. And all of us, whether we're, we're raising children at a certain age or not, have a role to play with those kids. The, you know, I'll pull a scripture each week just to kind of highlight this. But when the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to Timothy, Timothy was kind of his son in the faith, but it wasn't his biological son. He, he kind of gives a shout out to the people who shaped Timothy's life. And this is what he says. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, Timothy, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. It's not just about the parents. It's about grandmothers and about grandfathers, about aunts and uncles, about older siblings, about neighbors that we have, that all of us would be the kind of community that invests in the kids who are in our lives. Last week I told you about... Um, one of my grandfathers, inspiring experience to me. Um, he wasn't the only one. Um, I have an uncle, this is my Uncle Bill. He's my favorite uncle. Hope none of my other uncles are watching online right now. Um, but my Uncle Bill is kind of unique because he was 15 years younger than my dad. So my dad was the oldest and he was the youngest. And he was only 13 years older than me. So he was kind of in that prime stage to be the cool uncle, right? And my dad was awesome in so many ways, but there were parts of life that my dad had no interest in. In my home growing up, we were not gonna have pets, but my Uncle Bill had a dog, and I thought that was awesome. My dad was not a fisherman, a hunter, outdoorsman at all, but my Uncle Bill taught me how to fish. He's the one who let me shoot a gun for the first time and, and took me hunting. I'm like, how cool is that? My, my, you know, my parents didn't have cool cars, but my Uncle Bill had a cool car. And, and he would let me ride in it, and we'd go have conversations. And I, I wrote my Uncle Bill a letter just a few years ago and said, thank you. Thank you for being the voice in my life, someone who took time, you know, someone who made space in their life for me and spoke things into my life and over my life that really matter. And if you're an aunt or an uncle or any role, do not underestimate the power you can have in kids' lives. So last week I said the superpower of every person or every parent is that you get to set your aim. It was a big picture conversation. I asked you what the big rocks, the biggest priorities in your life are. What are you hoping your kids look like when they're 25 and 35? What's the most important developmental goals? Athletics could be important. Art could be important. Academics could be important. I hope that faith is important. In fact, I actually hope faith trumps some of those others because of the lifelong effect and even next life effect that it will have on your kids. You don't wanna mix up those priorities. I'm asking you to aim at what values, just one or two solid values you, your family is gonna be about and, and make sure if you're not hitting them that you readjust and you say, we know who we wanna be as a family. I hope you're aiming at the environment that you create in your home. What marks that environment? And, and you know, you're not, it's not happening randomly. You and your spouse, or if you're a single parent, you know what you're aiming at. That is, that is your superpower. It, theologically, it is the idea that God gave you the power to choose, a free will, 
And that's the biggest way to use that power. So if that's your superpower, today I want to talk about your kryptonite. The kryptonite of every person and every parent is flying solo. Flying solo. You know, if, if I was to design a life where you were aiming at being foolish, tired, and lonely, I would say, hey, don't ask anybody for help. Don't get wisdom. Don't join any parts of a community. Don't invest relationally with anyone else. Don't let them invest relationally with you. Don't ask for advice any, anywhere you can find it. Don't build friendships. If I was aiming for you to be foolish, tired, and lonely, I would say make sure you isolate yourself. And you do you. You just, you just fly this on your own. And when you're raising your kids, don't look around for any other supports or any other help. You, you do you. Make sure, make sure they get you and you alone. If I was aiming at you being foolish and tired and lonely. But I'm not. Maybe you've heard the old proverb. It says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And this journey of parenting is, is not a sprint. It is a marathon. And if you want to be successful at the marathon and be able to go far, you'll go together. I would only add to that, if you want to have fun, do it with some other people too. And to think that you could build out your life in such a way that you are not flying solo as a parent, but you have people around you. You have a unity with your spouse that could really shape the kids in your lives. I mean, that would overcome the kryptonite. And it is a kryptonite because everything in our world, almost everything in our world is pulling you into isolation. It's no surprise to anyone, I don't think, that, I mean, for the last generation, this is 20 or 30 years now, like a lot of the social fabric and institutions of our world, they're, they're just fading away. They're leftovers with 60-year-olds and 70-year-olds and 80-year-olds in them, if they're lucky. This is the Lions Club and the Rotary Club and the Optimist Club and the VFW. The, those things that used to be like, oh yeah, we're together, right? And of course, it's true in church life also. I mean, I think almost everyone around here has heard me refer to the idea that I want church to be relational, but it's absolutely true everywhere in church, including at Suncrest, that these days, many, many people don't make church relational. They, they walk in, they sit in the seats, I'm on the stage, we look at each other, back of each other's heads, and you go home. And of course, I want you to take steps and to be like, hey, be part of a serving team. You'll find some friends there, you'll work together, you'll, you'll maybe be someone you ask for advice. Find a group, it's, it's, it's a chance to, to share life a little bit together. And many people resist that. And, and, and it's not just in, in kind of those social ways that we integrate life together, it's actually in the way that we're learning. When you have a question and you're trying to figure something out, Many people today, instead of asking someone, going to their dad or to their mom or to a brother or to a friend, they just ask Siri. They just Google it. And, and maybe that's your situation. You're like, well, I'm just gonna figure it out on myself. It's, it's uncomfortable to ask someone else, and so I'm going to isolate myself. But I'm just telling you, if you are trying to build out a life where you are a fool, you are tired, and you are lonely all the time, I would absolutely encourage you to disregard social connections. Let yourself be consumed by activities, particularly activities of your kids, and just ask Siri when you need some help. You know, for people who are isolating themselves physically, you know, it leads to exhaustion physically and mentally and emotionally. And perhaps even more concerning, people who are isolating themselves are becoming exhausted psychologically. You know, the, the research on this these days, this is, this is I, I mean, I don't know if you know this, that there's essentially no difference between people who are constantly thinking about themselves and people who are wrestling with mental health issues. This is not a Venn diagram where they overlap a little bit. 
for people who constantly think about themselves. And you might even think it's healthy. I need to know who I am. I need to think about my identity. I need to think about who I am. I need to think about what I'm struggling with. I'm forced to become self-conscious of who I am. I'm all in my own mind. I'm thinking about myself. That is an absolute recipe for a darkness in your mental health. But in the moments that you start to think about others, you start to engage others, you'll be both a receiver and a giver in those social relationships. That is a pathway for you to actually face the difficulties that you have and ask someone for help facing the difficulties that you have. That is the pathway out of darkness and depression and mental health. That is what healthy counselors lead people to do. And so I just beg of you in life and in parenting to not construct your life in such a way that you're flying solo such a big deal. So, for the sake of the kids in our lives, I have two things for you today. I want to make sure that parents are pulling together. That parents are in unity and pulling together. Now, in this section, in just a moment, I'm going to talk to those of you who are parents and to talk about how you and your spouse, maybe you and your ex-spouse, but you're raising kids together, how important it is for there to be a unity and a support of one another in order to go the same direction. But before I talk to the parents in the room, can I talk to everyone? Talk about how important it is that you and I encourage couples to pull together. I reference pretty often that, you know, I lead a men's group. I've, I've had kind of three iterations of that over the last five or six years. And the, the group that I have now, we meet on Saturday mornings for an hour. And, you know, it's, it's just been awesome. Like lot, lots of laughter, lots of encouragement. We were having a text thread today because one of the guys in our group is um, a principal at a school. And he texted us all last night to say, hey, could you guys pray for me? I got this massive evaluation today. And then after the evaluation was done, he texted us and we're all celebrating that together. Like, it's just good to be part of a, a community of guys. When, when I started this men's group, I aimed at having young dads who weren't connected anywhere else at Suncrest. And so that's who ended up around the table. And I have a few minor goals for the men's group that I lead. Um, but I have one major goal, and I don't think I've said this to the guys in my group. Some of them are sitting in the room tonight. So let me just out myself. This, this is my major goal for the guys in my group. It would be that their wives are happy that their husbands are in my group. I mean, I'm taken away from their wives. Saturday morning for an hour and a half, depending where they live, maybe a couple hours. Have to drive, have to be there. And, and the goal for me is that their wives would be happy that their husbands are in my group. And I've gotten a little affirmation from some of their wives. Hey, this is good. This is good for us. This is good for our family. This is good for our kids. Because what I want to do as an outside person is help Couples pull together. Now, if you are a grandparent, your role in helping your child's marriage or relationship pull together cannot be overstated. As a grandparent, you may have some instincts inside of yourself to speak to your son or to speak to your daughter and say, hey, are you sure you guys are doing that right? I'm not sure she's, I'm not sure he's, I'm not. And that, that you would actually seed, maybe intentionally or maybe unintentionally, something that actually pulls your son and daughter-in-law apart or your daughter and son-in-law apart. But I'm asking those of you who are grandparents to say one of the greatest gifts that you can give to your grandchildren is to be the biggest fan of your daughter-in-law or your son-in-law and support them, embrace them, encourage them to figure this out together. Do whatever you can to help those parents pull together and never drive a wedge, never drive a wedge between them. Now, for those of us who are parents, of course, it's a big deal to pull together. Let, let me look at a few passages of scripture that, that kind of refer to this. Uh, there's a passage in 2 Corinthians 6. I, I think this is an absolutely fascinating packet, passage because people misinterpret it all the time. It says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. 
So I say this all the time in this room. There are people who are Christians. There are people who are not Christians. There are people who are followers of Jesus, people who aren't followers of Jesus. You might say there's believers and there's unbelievers. And I'm grateful that we're all in the room together. It's not uncomfortable to me to talk about two different categories of people and, and talk to you in ways that are distinct because you are distinct <laughs> groups of people. This passage says, hey, if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, don't be yoked together with someone who isn't. Now, how does this get misinterpreted? Let me name two ways. It gets misinterpreted because some people take this and they say, oh, I think this means Christians aren't supposed to hang out with people who aren't Christians. This is not about hanging out. Not at all. Actually, let, let me be your pastor. If you're a Christian, one of the commandments in the scriptures is that you hang out with people who aren't Christians. That, that we are salt and light in a world that we care about people, not just other Christians. We care about all people. We, we'd even want to have conversations that could potentially lead them to faith. We'll be the best friends to people who aren't Christians. One of the greatest accusations of Jesus was, he's a friend of sinners. Well, duh, right? This is what followers of Jesus then would do. This is not about isolating yourself from people who aren't believers. Yoked is an important word. The other misinterpretation that, that happens here is, I think, a misinterpretation in tone. Um, it's possible that you grew up in a church that was like kind of hyper-conservative, and the guy on the platform usually, usually yelled and held a big Bible. And when he got to this passage, he would, he'd wave that at you. Don't you be yoked together with unbelievers. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't think that's how Paul wrote it. I, I mean, work with me on this just for a minute. What's he saying? Paul is making an observation that is obvious wisdom to anyone who would read it. He'd say, hey, if you're a follower of Jesus, it's the defining thing of your life. It's the most important thing in your life. It shapes who you are, your values, your aims, all, all those things. Um, and if you were to enter into a relationship where the two of you need to be going the same direction all the time. That's what yoked together means. What would this mean? Well, marriage is one of the obvious places where it'd say, hey, don't be, don't be yoked together with an unbeliever. I actually see this happen in business partnerships. People who are in business together, you got your finances tied together, you got to make decisions together. Like you are yoked together. You have to go in the same direction. And I encourage people who are followers of Jesus in business all the time to say, hey, I, I actually wouldn't be in a partnership with someone who is not a believer. And you might think, well, Greg, isn't that, that narrow-minded? I don't think it's narrow-minded at all. I think it's kind of obvious, actually. I'm not saying that people who aren't believers aren't good people. There are good people who are not followers of Jesus. That, that's not what this is saying. What this is saying is that the core of who you are and the direction that you're setting, and for parents, the direction that you're setting, you got to be going in the same direction. And, and I think what, what it means is for a follower of Jesus... Someone might say to you, hey, I think we can do this together. But, but you need from them before you would marry them. Someone saying, if you would say, this is what I'm setting the course on for our kids and for our families. I'm leading them to believe in Jesus, to follow Jesus in everything that they do. And if you're not a follower of Jesus and you don't believe in this, like, are you gonna be on board with that? That 100% of the time we're going in this direction. And so there's a good warning here. And maybe this is as much for people who haven't been married yet, aren't married right now. Like if you're gonna pull together as parents to have a shared faith and vows, completely shared, oh, it's everything. I understand some of you are in situations right now where that's not the case. And you probably feel the dilemmas of that not being the case. I'm not condemning you. I, I, I just wanna make sure that we talk about the ideal, and what we would aim at given the opportunity. There's another passage. This is in Ecclesiastes chapter four. Often read at weddings, and so you might listen to these words and think of it as a marriage passage. But I'm gonna read this passage, and I want you to think of it as a parenting passage, okay? You think about your kids, you think about your spouse, you think about who you're raising kids with. Here's the idea. Two are better than one because they have a good return 
for their work, for their labor. Um, surely Jenny and I are not the only ones who are saying like, tag, you're in when we're parenting. I gave him his bath. You put him to bed. I'm tapping out. You're tapping in. And it is true that two are better than one because you have a good return for your labor. And you should find someone who will work together with you. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity the one who falls and has no one to help him up. And if you just think about in your parenting, how you fall down in your parenting. I mean, this isn't that complicated, is it? I'll just talk about myself, okay? Where do I fall down in my parenting? I give in. I give in. I let the kid, most dads do. Is that what you said? <laughs> I think it's true, so I'm going to let it go for today. Most dads do. All right. Hey, I'm acknowledging it, right? So where do I fall down? I got to get reset here for a second. I give in, right? I, 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 I've gotten tired. I make it easy. I, you know, I, maybe the value Jenny and I had established together isn't really that important to me. It was important to her, and so I said yes to it. But in the moment when the kids are doing something, I give in. That's when I fall down. And it's really interesting if your husband falls down or on the off chance that your wife might fall down. <laughs> do you help him up? Yes. Or do you push him down? They messed up. They did it wrong. What do they experience from you as a spouse? Do you help him up? Or do you push him down? You know, last week I talked about how with kids, what gets rewarded gets repeated. Um, the same thing is absolutely true with your spouse. The places that you encourage them, the places that you affirm them, they notice that and they will do it again. And the places you don't, they notice that too. This is parents pulling together. Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. Uh, I'm going to say, say this. If two lie down together, they'll keep calm. And parents helping one another be calm is a big deal for the environment that you're creating for your kids. But how could one keep calm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, we all kind of have the image right now, like the kids have taken over the house, right? But, but it's not so much that as um, I, I'm just out of gas and I'm starting to give up. And I need, my, I need my wife's voice in my life so that we can defend ourselves. It's a team. We're pulling together. It's unity. And if you're flying solo, if you're pulling apart from the person that you're raising kids with, listen, there are some circumstances where the person you're raising kids with wants to lead their kids down such a horrible path, you have to be the one to pull the other direction, right? But on many, many of the, the big things in life, it's more important that you're on the same page together than that you get your way. And being together, pulling together matters. The passage ends like this. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And that third strand, the image of this, is that your faith in God, woven together with the two of you, is a strength in your parenting. It's interesting also in 2 Corinthians uh, 13, it says this. Parents, strive for full restoration. So when your kids are doing something wrong, we're not striving for punishment. We're not striving for them to feel some pain. What we're striving for is for them to be reset in their full restoration. Encourage one another. If you hear me repeating something today, it is that if you're in a situation where you're married and you're raising kids together, the person who's with you needs encouragement, not discouragement. 
You know how the word encouragement is fit together, right? It literally, literally pulls apart so that you understand your encouragement gives someone courage. And we need courage to raise good kids. And if you discourage them, you are taking away their courage that is going to be necessary for you to raise kids together. Someone in this room, this is how God is getting your attention today. That in your marriage, the reset is we have got to encourage one another. We have to be of one mind. (laughs) One mind. Can you imagine a team going out to the field where half the team was working on one playbook and half the team was working off a different playbook? But I see it happen all the time in parenting. And I understand the conversation because we're tired and it's hard. And it's like, Greg, when would I ever find time to sit down and decide what the playbook is? To work that through all the way that it needs to be worked through. And I, I, I don't have a technical answer to tell you when you're going to find that time. I just have a warning. That if you don't find the time, your kids will pay the price for it. So do everything you can to employ the supports around you so you can find the time to say we're of one mind. We're on the same page about what we're aiming at, about how we're disciplining, about the next stages for our kids. Now, for the sake of the kids in our lives, here's the other thing. I want us to embrace the supports that are around us. You know, it's so fascinating to me that, that if you have children, you know, they're primarily your responsibility. But to have a community of people who are around you makes all the difference in the world. Last weekend, I shared the statistic that particularly when it comes to faith development, one of the absolute key factors of success is that our children, and especially our teenagers, have one adult in their life who is not their parent, who is shaping and setting the direction of their life. I finished last week's message, and I kind of walked down over here, and I looked over in the corner, and I see one of the young adults in our church. His name's Shane, and he's over there talking with a guy named Larry, and when I look at him, I'm like, yeah. Back when Shane was in the youth group, Larry was his youth leader, I'm like, how awesome is that? And then literally, I'm out in the commons area, and I talked to Shane, and he said, yeah, I was telling Larry, thank you for being that one non-parent in my life who shaped who I am in my faith. And, and he said what we all know. He's like, you know, my parents would say things, and then Larry would say things, and I wouldn't listen to my parents, but I would listen to Larry. And then when I was talking with my friends this week who have teenagers, we were talking about their experience here in our youth ministry. And they said, yeah. I said, well, well, who's their leader? And you know what they said? Shane. Shane. The same kid who had an adult invest in his life is now investing in your teenagers' lives. And I'm like, this is, the, this is why we do church over and over again. So we have to embrace these supports. You, you probably appreciate that when the scriptures describe how, how at least a healthy church would function, um, it's not about attending worship services. It's about being involved in one another's life. 59 times in the New Testament, we get the phrase, one another, one another, love one another, encourage one another, spur on one another. I'll go over a few in just a minute. That's the, that's the whole concept of what church is. And then, of course, the test for all of us who are part of church is to say, both, am I receiving that? Right? If we're supposed to love one another, am I receiving that love? And also, since we're supposed to love one another, am I giving that love? And to know that there's an environment here that supports that. So we appreciate that the scriptures say things like, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And this is my question. I want you to answer it in your head. Who's the person that's sharpening your parenting? Is there somebody? If there is a person who has helped you be a better parent, like they're in your support structure, then I want to ask you before the day is done to text them and say, thanks for being my iron. I mean, this is everything in 
in our lives. I have people in our lives who have who've been beside us in raising our kids. I'm like, thank God that there are people who help me with that. And if you're being honest, like I actually don't have anybody I could text right now who's helping sharpen me as a parent, then I want you to think about that because it's possible you actually have people in your lives, but you're not asking them. You're not utilizing them. You haven't humbled yourself in such a way that says, hey, I'm gonna kind of raise my hand and say, I don't have this figured out and try to gain some wisdom. And it's also possible you don't have anyone like that in your life. Now, Suncrest is serious about resourcing parents and helping you with the next generation. So let me very quickly just say, if you text the word resources to 94,000, we will reply to that text with a, a series of resources that we have that we wanna help you with. You know, there are certain things in our programming that we want you to, to know about for your kids and your teens. There's weekly programming, but there's certain events coming up this summer and, and play, steps that you can take. Like We want you to know about those. There are some books and some podcasts and some resources like that that we've linked, linked as a reply to this text. You'll get that. Like th- There's some great resources that are out there. We have groups, right? I have a men's group. Mine, mine is absolutely full right now, so I cannot invite you into my men's group. But we have other groups for men, for women, for moms, for dads, for couples. And, and we would love if you're, if you're like, I don't have anybody. Like, this is what our church is built on. We want to we have you have a, a community of people that you could build friendships with and find support. And there's even um, two recommendations for professional counselors if you text this in. So, hey, is your, is your raising kids counseling for you as a parent? or potentially counseling for your child, if something serious needs to be addressed, it's all right there. If you'll just text the word resources, we know parenting is hard. We want to help. So let me just end with a list of the one another's. Be devoted to one another. You know, this is the question. Just think about our church family. Are you devoted to somebody else here? Is somebody else here devoted to you? This is the vision of the church. Love one another. Instruct one another. This isn't one guy instructs everybody. This is, hey, you got experiences. I have experiences. We're working through this together. Let's instruct one another. Let's you instruct one another. Use the supports that we have. Serve one another. Show up and babysit some kids for parents who need to go out and get on the same playbook. Let's just serve one another. We can make another list. Be devoted to one another. Carry each other's burdens. Be patient, bearing with one another. Let's just go through the list. Encourage one another daily. Spur one another on. It's one of my favorites because I like leading people. I'm like, you know what spurs are, right? Right? They feel great right? Nope. But I don't need people to help me feel great if I'm going down the wrong path. I need somebody to spur me to say, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. And we're we're responsible for one another in that way. Confess your sins to one another. You know, around the table of my men's group, for guys to say, I swear I'm not getting it right. Well, actually, that passage says this. It says, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other, and you will be healed. So this is my plea, that you do not fly solo with your parenting. That together as parents, for those of us who are supporting parents, we help them pull together and that we access the support networks around us that are available so that we're not foolish and tired and lonely. There are a lot of things that go on here at Suncrest Church, and I want you to know about them. In fact, I actually just want you to know about the top four things, which you can find at suncrest.org forward slash top four at any time. Things like our Phil's Friends collection, where we're collecting toiletry items for cancer patients around the country. Things uh, like the series of messages we're in that you just listened to. And things like joining a group or a serving team. I want you to check out suncrest.org forward slash top four if you're looking for what you can do on your faith journey. Connect here at Suncrest. Darkness run for
Every week, we pause everything we do, both in person and online, to focus on the love of Jesus during time of communion. In person, we use bread and juice, but online and on demand, use whatever you have available to represent Jesus' body, his blood that was broken, poured out for us, so that those of us who follow him might be able to realign, refuel, and refocus us on his love. If you're watching this and you wouldn't define yourself as someone who follows Jesus, I'm glad you're watching, because Suncrest is a safe environment to wrestle with your questions about Christianity and Jesus, alongside lots of other people on the same journey as you. I'm going to put a timer, some scripture on the screen here shortly. You can feel free to eat and drink and reflect when you're ready.
Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Suncrest On Demand. If you liked it, hit the like button. If you want to see more content like this from Suncrest Church, hit subscribe on our YouTube channel. If you know someone who needs to hear this, someone who knows a kid in their life, go ahead and hit the share button on whatever social media platform you use. I hope you join us next time as we continue this series, and I hope that you experience change that only comes from following Jesus. Bye now.